Well, my heart is full this morning, uh, but I want to, before I even go anywhere, I wanted to, I wanted to say something. Um, I really felt prompted in worship to say this, um, and I'll tell you why in a moment. Um, you know, God's doing something in our church. I don't know whether you're really in tune to it, or in tune to that or not, but, uh, you know, I, I get around a little bit. I have over the years. Um, and, you know, we may not have the, the biggest crowds attending, but God is, is actually positioning us to lead an army to impact a city and a people. I believe that. Um, Pastor Derek has been ministering and preaching and teaching some pretty incredible revelation of truth. I, I, wrote, I wrote a note to my dear friend Dave McGrew. Many of you know him because he's been in our church. Um, and I'm going to read what I wrote him. Um, just a piece of what I wrote to him just the other day. And I'm not reading this for Derek's sake, I'm reading it for your sake. I, I said to my friend, he said, Pastor Derek has been preaching some powerful messages that are way beyond the common. Now, I don't know what happened to Derek, maybe he left town, no, I'm sure he's around here somewhere. I don't know if he's hearing me right now. Uh, if he's not, he'll have to get the, get the, he's there when Nicole says he's there. Um, if Derek ever gets full of himself, God will deal with him. So I'm not reading that to encourage him. I'm reading that to let you know that it's because God is really up to something. And, you know, I've been teaching and preaching the word for over 40 years. And it never gets easy. It never gets, um, well, I can just do that. It's always a labor. It always requires you to get with God and get to God and to get into the Word and hear from God. And I know Derek understands that anybody that preaches regularly realizes they carry that weight in their life. It's something that you carry. You're called to carry. There's a grace to carry it. But you... And, and if you ever get to the place where it's just commonplace, you're going to miss God. You're going to start preaching out of your own ability. And, and, and I know that's not Pastor Derek. And um, I know that he, he gives himself to prayer and the word. You know, Acts chapter 6, in the beginning of the church, uh, the, the early apostles appointed leaders in the church because they said, we need to give ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. It's right there, go read it, Acts chapter 6. And I know Pastor Derek does. So for those of you that are stepping up and, and, and offering your grace giftings, your giftings in your life to help build the church, you're doing that in part so that your pastor can give himself to prayer and the ministry of the word. Okay, that has nothing to do with my message. I just wanted to add that in. Maybe a little apostolic exhortation to you. Um, how many have ever read a book? <laughs> Dumb question. <laughs> this really wasn't what I was going to say. It just came out that way. Of course, we've all read a book. Hopefully, you got past, you know, Go, Spot, Go. And <laughs> Murray would remember that. <laughs> But, you know, it's in our, it's been around all my life and certainly is today. There's sort of a, a, a literary culture or expectation that if you write a book, you write an introduction to the book. You can just about find every book has an introduction. How many have ever skipped the introduction and just jumped into the book? Matter of fact, I do it all the time. I don't want to hear your fluff. I want to know what you're going to do. And then if it looks interesting, maybe at some point I'll go back and read the introduction. That's just the way my brain thinks. And uh, there's been times where I've read the whole book. I got so enthralled with it, I thought, well, I'm going to go back and read the introduction. And what you find out generally in the introduction is you get the real heart of what was in the author 
you know, when he decided to write the book. But sometimes it doesn't make any sense until you've actually digested what he's writing about. Well, you know, it's all good. Um, there's an introduction to just about every letter in the New Testament. I don't know how much you read those introductions. I, I, they tend to be, you know, from the Apostle Paul to, or, you know, from Peter to. And, you know, when you've read the scriptures a lot, you kind of just sort of, let's get past the introduction and let's get to the meat of this. That's been me. Um, in Paul's introduction, introduction to, the, to the, his letter to the Roman church, uh, in verse 7, he writes, right near the end of the introduction, he writes... To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Saints, just don't get confused. Saints just means you're a believer. You're a Christian. You're a follower of Christ. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a prayer. He's actually praying for grace and peace over them. Now, you may not know this. I didn't know this until I actually took time to go back and read all the introductions in, a little, in, in context. First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, First and Second Thessalonians, and Philemon, these are all letters that Paul wrote, um, have a similar introduction. He prays for grace and peace. His two letters to Timothy and Titus are, are slightly different. He prays for grace and peace, but he adds mercy in there. I never noticed that before. I'm sure it's why these were his two sons, and he knows how much they messed up, because you always know how much your kids mess up. They, weren't, they were spiritual sons, and so he figured they need some mercy too, because you know, someone had to forgive them. Um, The Apostle Peter, he only has two letters. Both his letters are introduced by praying for grace and peace as well. And he actually says that they would be multiplied to you. He uses that term in there. I pray that grace and peace would be multiplied. Not just added, but multiplied. If you want to know about multiplication, go listen to Pastor Derek's message a few weeks ago. James didn't use grace and peace as a part of his introduction but he mirrored Peter's admonishment that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. He, he, he puts a huge emphasis on grace. In Second John, the second letter to John, we get grace, mercy, and peace will be with you. I don't know what happened to First and Third John. There's no grace and peace in them. But John obviously understood it. He wouldn't put it in his second letter. So, there's 125 references in the New Testament to grace. I looked it up, at least in my New King James Version. But I'm sure it's pretty similar in, in all. That's a pretty universal Greek, Bible Greek word. Only the, the two synoptic Gospels, Mark, Ma Matthew, Mark, and 1 John and 3 John, do not, even, do not use the word grace. Grace is, is so... Um, significant and, and, and so expanded upon in the New Testament, and yet it's something that we take for granted and we actually probably don't think about a lot, just like we skip the introductions. But obviously, Paul, now I, I'm not, I've talked on peace before, but I, I'm, I'm focused on grace here, so um, obviously, the early apostles, the writers of the New Testament, understood that grace and peace were so central to our lives that they actually prayed for it every time they wrote anybody. That's not insignificant. As a matter of fact, you know, until I was working on this message on grace, I didn't even know that. And I'd been preaching for 40 years. I mean, I knew they were there, but I didn't really, I kind of skipped over the introduction. But it kind of just was, was brought to me I think this is there, so we, we would attend to it, and yet I wonder how much we really have attended to it. In the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul deals extensively with how by faith in Christ, we're no longer under the law, a set of rules by the law of Moses, and therefore ruled by sin, but now we live under grace. 
There's 20 references in this book alone to grace, and he teaches extens- extensively on the work of grace to overcome sin. It's a good study. It's not my study today, but if you want to study about grace and how grace is the power of God to overcome sin, go get into Romans. It's all there. Okay, I'm just putting a stamp of emphasis on grace here as I, as I, so we don't skip the introduction. Romans 6.14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are now under law. You are not under law, but under grace. Okay, you can just hang on to that. In the book of Hebrews, we read in the fourth chapter, in verse 16, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. To the throne of grace. That we may obtain mercy. Mercy is forgiveness, if you want a little definition of that. that we, you know, we go to God to get forgiveness, but he, he calls it the throne of grace. That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Find grace to help. The throne of grace, God's going to forgive us. The Bible says if any man sin, that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he's just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We know that scripture. But when we receive his forgiveness, what we really need is grace to rise above it, to go beyond it. Forgiveness is wonderful. Grace is empowering. Forgiveness is wonderful. Grace is empowering. It actually paints a picture here, and that's why I wanted to, to kind of launch off this, this passage that when we come to God and come into his presence, come into his word, come, come, come towards God, when we push towards God as followers of Christ, we're actually coming to a place to receive grace. It's the throne of grace. It's the idea of us coming into the throne room of heaven. We don't physically go there. We will in, in, in the next life. But in, in the spirit realm, we can press into his very throne room. And, and the writer of Hebrews calls it the throne of grace. I think you get my point. That understanding the importance of grace and learning to access grace is absolutely foundational for every Christian who desires to be a true follower of Christ. It's not something we can just sort of, oh yeah. It's kind of like a glass of water. We can get it in the bathroom, we can get it in the kitchen, we can get it in the water fountain, we can buy it in the store. We, we don't think a lot about it, but if we didn't have it, we'd die. <laughs> but nobody thinks about I gotta get some water because I'm gonna die. <laughs> I suppose if you're on a desert island or <laughs> until, you, yeah, until, you, <laughs> until you don't have it. Yeah, and then really <laughs> Let me just tell you, we need to live by grace. And if you don't have it, you're gonna die spiritually. You're not gonna get what you need from God. Okay. If I got you interested in the topic, that was my goal. Now, there's a new anointing in the house. It's called a teaching anointing. You know, it's been bestowed upon me by Pastor Derek. And, and teaching always takes longer than preaching. So, <laughs> Okay, here we go. I picked up, I pulled a, uh, one definition of grace from a, a Christian website just because it seemed good. Grace is the basis for the Christian faith. We believe we are saved by faith through grace. We're going to look at that passage in a moment in, in, in some detail. God's grace is usually defined as undeserved or unmerited favor. It's like getting the favor of God. God says, I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do things for you that you don't deserve, like salvation. Grace cannot be earned. It is something that is freely given. It's a gift, actually, the gift of grace. 
So you can't, deserve, you can't earn God's grace. You can't merit God's grace. But I'll tell you what, you can sure receive it. And you need to. And you don't need to do it just the day that you got saved. So let's talk about our salvation for a moment. Because so foundational in understanding grace is understanding the part it played in, in each of our step from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Our transformation from being separate from God to becoming a child of God. You know, we use, we've got lots of Christian language when we were born again, when we received Christ, when, you know, we were redeemed from our, our sin nature. There's, there's all kinds of language we can use, but the reality of it is, is that when you became a follower of Christ, when, when, when he became alive in your life, Grace was right in the middle of it. In Ephesians chapter 2, this is one of the most famous New Testament Bible verses. Um, but God, who's rich in mercy because of his great love, which he have loved us, I'm in verse, starting in verse 4, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together in Christ. So, lost Separated from God, dead in our sins and trespasses. By that, it just means separated from God. We're spiritually not alive. Physically alive, spiritually dead. And then it says, by grace, you have been saved. By grace. And raised up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. In, in, in him and in as we've been brought into his kingdom, we actually, in the spirit, in spiritual sense, are sitting in heavenly places with him. That's our eternal residence with him. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Having been saved, for by grace... Did I write this wrong? Having been saved... Yeah, having been saved by grace through faith. I'll just quote it because I wrote it in my notes wrong. Um, not sure I did that, but anyway. The, the scripture says that having been saved by grace through faith, not of works, not anything that you did, it is the gift of God. It is the gift of God. So what happened Grace reached down and actually transformed you and me from one kingdom to another kingdom. It says it came through faith. You had to believe. So faith is very key. Faith is, is in essence, is one of the conduits through which grace operates. Faith is one of the conduits through which grace operates. God had the power to save you and me. God didn't have to get that. He always had it. But it was going to take his grace, his power, to, to actually transform us from one kingdom to another. Now, the reason he could do it was because of what Jesus did on the cross, because he paid the price. But the power came from God because even when we put our faith in what Jesus did on the cross, when we said, I believe in my heart and, and, and I'm willing to make it the confession of my life that Jesus died for me, then your faith in what Jesus did on the cross opened up a conduit for God's grace to come down and grab a hold of your life and transform you from one kingdom to the other. Let me, let me just tell you this. God's power comes through this, came through the conduit of faith. <laughs> it's okay. I can handle this. <laughs> but what was going through that conduit was his grace free gift of heaven. 
Sometimes, and, and I, I'm, I may step on a couple toes here. I stepped on my own toes. You ever step on your own toes? You usually trip when you do that. I've done that. I'm pretty good at it, actually. I've stepped on my own toes a little bit in some of this. Because, you know, sometimes we, some of us, you know, that share a common background thought faith was everything. But faith in itself doesn't do anything if it doesn't ca- get a hold of God. That's why you have to have faith in God. Because what it does, it grabs a hold of the power of God. And when it flows to you, it's grace. And so I, I really, we're, we're talking about grace. My message is entitled by grace. And I'm, I'm going to show you today, I think, I hope, from the scriptures, that there are several conduits through which grace operates in the scriptures. And I don't even think I'm going to get them all, but I'm going to get four or maybe five of them. And I'm, I'm going to show you this because some of us in days gone by have acted like our faith in God. And, you know, faith comes from his word, and so we get into his word. Faith rises up, and, and, and by faith we open up a conduit which God's power can work through. That's true. That's Bible. But if, if, if we think faith is it, we're going to miss God. Faith is central. Faith is important. But faith isn't everything. It's very significant. One of the things that I want to say about the, right at this point, I'm just sort of looking at my notes here because I got off them for a little bit. We need to understand the benevolent nature of our Heavenly Father. We need to understand that he's a loving God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God, the reason that grace, unlimited access to, or unlimited power from heaven to touch our lives is God loves us so much that he is so committed to getting his life, his power, his force to you so that you can live the life that he wants you to live. God is, is I, don't, I don't want to put the, the wrong descriptors on God here, but, but God has sold out his very being to getting his grace to humanity. God wants to get his full power, his full ability into your life and my life. Why? Because he loves us so much. It's like a parent. When you have children and you're raising your children, you'd do anything to help your kids. You would, you would just, you, you know, it, it's like nobody has to talk to you into blessing your own kids. As a matter of fact, sometimes you have to talk yourself out of doing it because it isn't always the best thing for them. Because in the very nature of being a parent is, and, and the love you have in your heart is you want to be a blessing to them. Sometimes bestowing benevolence on them isn't the greatest blessing for them. You can spoil them. I think God's got enough wisdom that he doesn't spoil us. But he certainly wants to give, him, give us all the ability to be everything that he's designed us to be. Now, I want to introduce you briefly to these four conduits. Now, a conduit, what's a conduit? Well, you know, I looked up one definition. It's a, it's a, it's a tube that water flows through, like a hose or a pipe. It's also, uh, you can look around this building and see metal pipes going across the roof, and you think, why is there a metal pipe? It's a conduit for wires to go through. In our sort of electrical code, a lot of, especially in commercial buildings, a lot of wiring goes through conduits. So it, 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 it creates a path from where the power is coming from, electricity, to where it needs to get to. It's the path. So God's created some conduits to get his power to us and into our lives, and that power is his grace. Okay, so let me, let me just talk really briefly. We see four of these conduits, I think, show up even in this initial understanding of Our salvation comes by grace through faith. No one comes to faith in Christ until they are willing to acknowledge that they need God's forgiveness. You know, you've got to get to the point where you say, you know, the the statement that's been used over the centuries is we're a sinner saved by grace. 
Now, I know some people never get past the sinner stage, and so they want to live as broken sinners forever. We actually, when we get born again, that sin nature gets taken out of us. So it's probably not a good idea to run around calling yourself a sinner. Uh, you might sin, but the nature has been changed in you. I don't want to get into that too far right now. But, but the point here is until you come to a place of recognizing the need for a Savior, that actually there's something about you that's imperfect. There's something about you that, that the, the sin in your life, the brokenness in your life, the imperfection in your life is going to um, keep you from a perfect holy God. And, and there's a price to be paid to fix that. And if you don't recognize that, somebody say, well, I live a good life. I'm a good person. You know, I think God's good with me. That person won't come to faith in Christ. They won't, they won't get to that place. They, there, there has to be a, a place of humility. Humility is when, I'm going to show you this a little later in detail, but humility is one of the conduits for grace. It's a huge one. It's one we don't talk a lot about, but it's so huge. I'm going to show you in a minute, but let me just, you can write it down. We're going to come back to it. Almost always when we come to faith in Christ, it's because we believed someone who preached the good news. A preacher. A testimony from another believer. At some point we receive that as truth. This requires us to actually set aside our thinking for somebody else's thinking. You get it, my point? We might have our own thoughts about life, but, you know, you're sharing your testimony with somebody, and you're sharing your story, and they're comparing their thinking to the story you just told them about your life. You come into a, to a service, and, and to use an, the, the extreme example, an evangelist gets up and preaches the good news of the gospel, and it confronts you, and you have to make a decision, am I going to believe that, or am I just going to believe the life I've been living? There's a Bible word that isn't used a lot that defines the ability to put our thinking under somebody else's advisement. It's called meekness. I don't have time. Meekness. Me meekness. The, the, the real Bible def definition of meekness is that we'll let somebody else teach us or instruct us. We'll let somebody else influence our thinking. So I really believe, I'm going to show you that I believe meekness and, and I'll explain this further as we go. Um, it's one of those things that's a great conduit for grace in our lives. There's grace that God wants to bring into your life, but in order to get it, you're going to have to be willing to allow somebody else to influence your thinking. Hmm. Okay, you're looking at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. That's okay. Hang in there. I'm just introducing these thoughts. The third thing, our conduit that I want to talk about to receive grace, is we have to receive God's love. We have to believe that God loves us. We have to come to that place where we actually understand the benevolence of heaven. I mentioned that a moment ago. His generosity or his charity. You know, in, in the old King James Bible, the word love was often translated as charity. And we think of charitable giving. Um, Benevolence, that's another word. I use that already. So God, the very, I, you know, the, I, I hit on this in, in the offering. Um, God, the very nature of God is to bestow blessing, is to be charitable. Love always wants to express itself in some kind of giving. That's why generosity, and, the, and, and Pastor Derek's been, been sort of teaching us on this, the genetics of generosity, which is just a play on words to get us, that, that, that should become our nature, is that generosity is really at the very core of who God is. I already said that earlier, but it's one of those things that God has given us that becomes a conduit for grace to operate in our life. I'm going to show you that. Hang in there. And then, of course, the fourth one, which I probably don't need to convince most of you because most of you have been well-schooled in this, is that faith 
what we believe. Faith is what you believe. And, and faith in God is what you believe about God. That's why the Bible is so key for us because the more we get into to the scriptures, we, we understand how God thinks about life. And as we believe his word, the scriptures tell us in Romans that faith comes by hearing and hearing from the word of God. So as we allow his word to get in us, faith rises up. And, and I think most of us, nobody here would argue that our faith in God is, is a conduit for God's grace or God's power to come into our life. Okay, I'm going to come back to these four things in a minute, but I want, to, I want to say a few things before I get back there. Grace is so important in our lives because you can't enter God's kingdom without it. You can't function in God's kingdom without it. You can't benefit from God's kingdom without it. And you can't minister God's kingdom to others without it. Like, oh, I guess we better get this grace thing. Because, first of all, without it, you wouldn't have been a believer. All the things that God wants to work through and in your life, you're not going to get it without his grace. You're not going to be able to do the things he wants you to do without his grace. And all the people that you're supposed to influence in your life, you won't without grace. You can try in your own efforts. How many have tried to do a lot of things in their own efforts and found out that mostly what you did is get tired? <laughs> but when you begin to flow in God's grace, it just goes quick. I mean, I've, I've labored to share Christ with people, and then I've tapped into his grace, and it just seems like, well, that was easy. So anyway, that's just, just a... We often talk about um, praying for the sick. You know, the Bible says in, in Mark that we can lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. I believe that. And I've prayed for lots of sick people and I've seen lots of sick people get recovered. But that's God's grace. It's not me. I don't have any power. But if I can't get God's grace flowing, now I'll say this. I probably was going to say it later, but I can say it right now. It seems pretty evident if you read the Gospels, uh, particularly Luke's Gospel, when Jesus ministered healing, faith was really key. Faith was the most predominant conduit that we see, see working to get grace flowing. But often when I pray for people, I pray for, you know, the grace of healing, the virtue of healing to manifest in people's body. But it's really another word for the power of God. Our Father in heaven desires that his children have, all, all, have access to all of his power. You believe that? I believe that. All of his strength, all of his wisdom, all knowledge, all peace, all endurance, patience and perseverance, all kindness, all compassion. He wants us to have access to all these things. As well, he wants us to live under an open window of supply and an open door of divine favor. He wants us to experience a life of health and divine healing. And he wants us to have the ability to carry that grace to others. As a matter of fact, some of the greatest ways to get the power of God flowing to your life is when you begin to give it out to others. I know I'm being a little redundant, but very intentionally. God wants us to access grace every day, in every situation, for every purpose to which we are called. Because it's a free gift, it's always available. We do receive grace often. You probably receive grace more than you know, but probably not often enough. So I'm not trying to suggest you don't have an experience the grace of God. I know you have. All of us have. But I think God wants us to experience it more. I think that's why God's... So let me have a brief look here at the Apostle Paul and his call, life, and ministry. No, we're not going to study his whole life. This is going to be very brief. And what he said about grace. 
Let's just have a look. Most of us know who the Apostle Paul, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. He had an assignment to take the gospel to the Gentiles, the non-Jewish world. He was called to declare salvation to all men, to stand before rulers and men of influence, to demonstrate God's supernatural power wherever he went, to impart grace to others. As an apostle, he planted churches across Asia, raised up leaders, set elders in every church, in every city he ministered. Ultimately, he would end up being arrested and brought to Rome and to stand before Caesar. He was imprisoned in Rome, house arrest, where he would author two-thirds of the New Testament. He became a martyr for his faith. He was executed for his faith. The Bible tells us, he tells us in, in, the, in his, his letter to the Corinthians that he was constantly under a spiritual attack. Constantly under attack. The persecution that was raised against him was nonstop and relentless. In 1 Corinthians 11, he writes, 23 to 28, I am more... More than he was writing to some of the Corinthian believers that were not happy with him in the moment. In labor is more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prison, he's describing his ministry. In prison more frequently, in death often. He was left for dead three times. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. I don't know why I didn't say 39, but anyway. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've been in the deep, out in the ocean. And he didn't mean a boat, he meant floating around in the water. In journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. In weariness and in toil. In the sleeplessness, often in hunger and thirst and fasting, often in cold and nakedness. And besides all these things, what comes upon me daily is my deep concern for all the churches. Who wants to sign up for an apostleship? (laughs) He wrote back, to the church at Corinth and he says I was talking to God about this and this is what he told me Paul just so you don't get too puffed up in pride and think you're a big guy he writes it like this unless they should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelation a thorn in the flesh was given to me And it describes a messenger of Satan to buffet me. He was under demonic attack. Lest I be exalted above measure concerning the things that I pleaded. And I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. He said, God, deal with this. I don't want it anymore. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. What does that tell you? It doesn't matter what you go through. There's grace to get through it. If you can tap into God's grace, you got it. You got it. Crazy, eh? Is grace important? Is it just a comment in the introduction? (laughs) Maybe we need to go back and read the introduction. (laughs) Maybe it was there for a reason. In every introduction? Now, peace comes along with it, and I'm not going to get into it because I don't have time to, but... but, um, When you tap into God's grace, you're going to get peace. I promise you. It says, therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities and in reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, I am strong. If there's anything we can learn as Christians is that we don't have to be strong in ourselves. We just have to tap into God's grace. And he'll get us through. When we access grace, it's always enough. Grace will come when it's needed. I've taught this. You can build up your faith, which is the conduit to connect to God, but you don't get 
to store up grace. Grace is uh, you're accessing God and grace flows. Okay. This tablecloth isn't representative of a a table that won't stand up properly. And I think Brian's going to come and help me. Um, I got a little illustration. I've got this Derek, Pastor Derek anointing on me now. (laughs) So every good message has to have an object lesson, right? I promise I won't throw hamburgers. (laughs) And it's not that I've never, I mean, we bake cookies in church, so. Okay, so what we're going to do here is I want to give you a little illustration. And, uh, you know, I thought of ways to make it better than this. Yeah, you can just put that there for now. Brian's going to plug some things in for me here. So I've got three different devices here that we're going to um, bring some power to. Now, most of you know, because um, we live with it all the time, we don't think about it a lot, but, but if you plug into an outlet in your home or here, you're going to get 120 volts of AC power. It's hooked up to the power grid. I think most of the power in our province comes from a couple of big hydro dams. Um, there's a few coal-fired plants down south. And we can hook into that power. And we plug a cord in. Um, I don't know how many of you paid attention in science in high school. It's amazing all the people that said they hated it. But the measurement of power in our, you know, is voltage. Volts, right? You know what that is? You heard that? Volts? Okay. When power flows through a conduit, it's measured in something called, you know, amps. Amps. Amperage. Amps. The measure of power flowing is amps. When it impacts whatever device, let's try one here. So if I, come on. Oh, there it is. If I turn the switch on, we get light. Matter of fact, just so you don't feel left out over on the other side, I'll give you some too. (laughs) So now we've got light, when, when the volts flowing through the wire, the amps impact whatever device they're supposed to, we measure that in watts. You know, that's why you buy a 60 watt light bulb or a 100 watt light bulb. So the, the, the formula, I, they might even put it up there. And my son Brian, he did a lot of physics. He'll tell me if I'm wrong, but I think I got this right. So power is volts, volts, flo- volts flowing or amps. Power received is watts. Watts equals volts times amps. Simple, basic, basic math. So the thing that's really interesting is we can get light. We can get heat. This, if you could come up here, this is turning red hot. We get heat, and actually, crazy. We can get music. Same power. We must have got a little grace to turn the light back on. But I'm going to turn them off anyway. You get the point. Um, My point really is yeah, it's the heater. I thought we had it on a different circuit. That was the plan. But maybe we didn't. I know you can't put too many devices on the same breaker. And yet I'll tell you what with God. 
we can all plug in and he's never going to short circuit you. <laughs> but if you don't use the right conduit, you can melt the wire. That doesn't mean that God hasn't lost any power, but you might not be accessing it. So the issue isn't power. I think if you want to go to that next thing, if you've got it up there, um, grace is the flow of God's power to supply what we need in every situation in life. Grace is the flow of God's power to supply what we need in every situation in life. So God's power times grace equals what we need. God's power, bolts, times grace, amps, power flowing, equals what you need. What do you need? What do you need from God? You need his grace. You need his power flowing into your life. There it is. So, I've got another little power device, but you're not going to get to look at that until the end. Okay. God has unlimited power. We have unlimited needs. We just need to get God's grace flowing. God has unlimited power. We have unlimited needs. We just need to get God's grace flowing. Apparently, according to the New Testament writers, we're supposed to actually pray for grace. Because each one of those books is introduced, introduced with a prayer for grace. Just a thought. That was, it was my main thought. It just kind of jumped into me as I, was, as I was putting this together. So how do we access grace? So that's really, how am I doing here for time? We're good. So I want to talk about accessing grace. Because I think I've convinced you that we need it. And maybe I didn't need to convince you, but maybe, maybe it's a little clearer. Um, I'm going to give you four access points or four conduits. I already did, but I'm going, to, I'm going to develop them a little more. The first one is humility. Let me just throw this at you. 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6 reads like this. God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he might exalt you in due season. Anybody ever read that before? You know what? If you have too much resistance in electrical wire, it, it melts. If you have a bad connection, and you get resistance and the flow can't get through, it starts to melt. God actually says that he'll be the resistor if you don't humble yourself. Pride which basically says, I can do it. Pride says, I got it. Pride says, don't tell me what to do. Pride says, my way, that's all I need. Humility, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Get on your face before God and say, God, I don't know what to do. I want to know what you want for me. An attitude of humility is a conduit for God's grace to flow in your life. Philippians chapter 2, not in my notes, sorry, up there in the booth. Chapter 2, verse 4, 3. Um, Have this mind in you, which was in Christ Jesus, who humbled himself, became a servant, and humbled himself, even the point of death, death on the cross. That God would exalt him and raised him up. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead. How did Jesus access the power of heaven? He humbled himself. He laid his life down. He put himself under. He laid his life down. The most powerful thing that ever happened in the universe wasn't the creation of the sun, the stars. It was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
It's what God was doing when he defeated death, hell, and the grave and raised Jesus from the, and, and, and redeemed humanity. The conduit wasn't faith, it was humility. He laid himself down and humbled himself. Brothers and sisters, it may well be that you're having trouble accessing God's grace because you haven't humbled yourself under the mighty hand of God. James, in his letter, it's the only reference he has to grace, he actually, in James chapter 4, verse 6, says the exact same things. God resists the proud and exalts those who humble themselves. So humility is foundational. I'm, I could do a whole message on humility. I'm not going to. I'll leave that to Pastor Derek. He can sort that out. That's the benefit of not being the senior pastor. You don't have to worry about those things. I don't need to say a lot about faith, but faith is in this list. We know we are saved through faith. It was grace that saved us, but it was through faith through what we believed. And I said this already. I knew I'd written somewhere in my notes that I think if you, if you read the healing miracles of Jesus, almost exclusively he points out to their faith. The one with the issue of blood, we know that one so well because it's so clear, who said, if only you can touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. And when she touched him and that virtue, that's grace, flowed into her life and she was healed immediately he looked at her and said, woman, your faith has made you whole. But it really wasn't, we have to understand that. It's her faith that allowed God's grace, God's virtue to travel. Faith isn't the virtue. Faith is the wire, it's the conduit that allows the power of God to flow into our lives. Because see, what, what, what happens if we don't understand it that way? We think it's about our faith. Then it becomes about us. And then we find ourselves over into pride, and then we cut off the grace of God. Told you I'd step on my toe. <laughs> yeah, we access God's power through faith. We access his grace through faith. But, but the power that works in our lives is nothing we can earn or merit. The grace comes without any qualification. You don't qualify to, get, to, to, to earn a healing. Well, I was good this week, God, to heal my body. That's, that's, that's so unbiblical. That's so unscriptural. And I know nobody's saying it, but sometimes we strive and work and try to work our faith, and I'm going to believe God, and, and, and it's all right to get in the Word and get our faith. You know, when faith is really active, when that conduit is fully attached, it flows. You just, I got it. God's got it. My faith's in God. He's going to do it. I don't need to worry about it. You don't have to strive. Grace flows. Now, let me get on this one. I, I got two more that I'm going to get on. That's all I'm going to get on. I want to get on the, the fourth one, so I won't stay too long on this third one. But this goes back to generosity. Have you noticed in that scripture I read in the offering in 2 Corinthians 8, it says that when we step into generosity, that God is able to make all grace. That's the only place that we see that, that understanding that, that the greatest capacity to grace comes from generosity. Why is that? I, I, I've, I've said, God, what is this about? You know what it is? Because generosity is the attribute of a loving father. God is love. The, the fullness of the nature of God is love. What do you mean by love? That he is willing to give everything for us. That he's able to, greater love hath no man than he lays down his life for his friends. It was written in John's Gospel. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The very, the, the, the loving, benevolent, charitable nature of our heavenly father is who he really is. He was willing to give everything for us. When generosity gets working in your life, you're actually demonstrating the very nature of God. That's why it's so powerful. See, if you give with simply a motive to get, you miss it. 
Now, the Bible does teach us that it opens a conduit of grace, supply in our life. But it doesn't if it's not generosity, if it's just meosity. I don't think that's a word, but I just invented it on the spot. That's why the whole idea that, you know, if, if, if you want to get, give. There is, there's truth there, but, but it's distorted truth. The motivation, I've said this for years, the motivation to give is, is love. I love you. I care. I care. I care more about you than I do about me. I'm willing to take what I have and give it to you. I'm willing to take from what would benefit me and be benevolent to you. That's what Father God did. That's why I believe it, it, it's a conduit that can release all grace. As a matter of fact, this genetics of generosity that there is, is much deeper than you realize because it's what's going to allow his grace to really flow out of this church. We want to impact the world out there, broken, hurting people. When we get past ourselves and are willing to love, which is going to cost us more than just a part of our paycheck, it's going to cost us our time and our energy and our focus, but when we get that working in our heart, this conduit of grace is going to flow, and we're going to see people's lives touched. Grace. Generosity is a conduit. Okay. How am I doing here? I'm going to make it. Now, I've got point four here, but I'm going to just state it, because I, the Lord kind of provoked this on me after I put this message together. You know, it says in, in, in 2 Peter in the beginning, in his introduction about praying for grace and peace being multiplied, it says, according to the knowledge, of, the knowledge of God in Jesus Christ. The more we know him, the more grace can flow. Paul said in his letter to the Philippians, he said, above all things, I pray that I might know him. I pray that I might know him. Brothers and sisters, your life in prayer your life getting to God and getting to know God is very central to getting, it, it is a conduit of grace operating in your life that you might know him. Grace and peace are multiplied according to the knowledge of it. The more you know God, more grace can flow. Now, I, don't, I've, I could develop that. I'm not going to. But I want to get on this other one. This thing that I, I, I defined as meekness. You know, the Bible says that Moses was the meekest man on all the earth. That's an Old Testament use of the word meekness. Um, Jesus actually wrote in his Beatitudes in Matthew 5 that the meek, blessed are the meek, shall they, for they shall inherit the earth. Have you ever wondered what that means, inherit the earth? Have you ever actually said, what do you mean? Am I going to get a plot of land? Am I going to get, you know, you know, there's all kinds of, let, 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 let me tell you just a thought, and I, I'm not going to try to build a doctrine, but I think it means that you're going to get everything you're supposed to have here on earth. There are things that we're supposed to do, things that we're supposed to have to enable us to do. If God's grace is working like it's supposed to in your life, God will make sure that everything that he's designed for your life will get into your life. And here on earth, not wait until we get to heaven. I don't know if you can, you know, I'm not going to try to define that. Does that mean, you know, a different house, a different car? I, I, maybe, maybe not. It's whatever God wants for you. Whatever, whatever, whatever open opportunity and favor and position and influence that God wants you to have in your life, it's going to take his grace to get it to you. I think meekness is the conduit that allows that to get into our life. Another way of defining meekness is that you're teachable. That you're a learner. That you're going to allow others to influence your life. That you don't live a life... See, someone that's not meek, they think they got it. I know, don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me how to live. I got a plan. It's my plan. I designed it. I've got the right to have my own plan. You do. You can do whatever you want to do. God's not going to... But if you want to get... If you want to inherit the earth, you want to inherit your realm on the earth, you're actually going to have to be willing to put yourself under that you might learn from others. Now, let me bring a context to this. This, this, is, this, is, this is 
my next 10 minutes, 12 minutes, and I'll land this thing by 12.30. Let's go back to Ephesians 4. Pastor Derek did a masterful job at giving us, really, I would say, an overview of giftings in our life. Talked about spiritual giftings, the Holy Spirit gifts, the Father's gifts, the nine Romans 12 motivational gifts. And then a couple weeks ago, he, he landed on these Ephesians 4 equipping gifts. And I, I think equipping is a great way of defining them. But let me tell you this. When grace is flowing in your life, you're equipped. Equipping isn't just more knowledge, more information. It's actually the ability to let the flow of God, the power of God work in your life so that you can do the things that God wants you to do. So let's look at this again. Verse 7, we'll start there for time. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. But to each one of us, grace is given. See, we're back on grace here. How do we get back to grace? Well, because that's what we're talking about. Therefore, he said, when he ascended on high and led captivity captive, he gave gifts to men. Jesus gave gifts to all men. Pastor Derek said that the other day. We've all got gifts. We've all got things that God's put into us that enable us, our lives, to be used for his kingdom. And then he goes on and says, now that he ascended, is one who descended. He's talking about how Jesus went into, into, into hell and defeated the works of darkness. Pastor Derek talked about that. Is also the one who ascended and sits at the right hand of the Father, uh, that he might fill all things, that the fullness of God might manifest. Does this sound a little bit like grace being distributed on the earth? How is God going to fill all things? God fills us is he wants to distribute his power, his grace to you, to you, to you, to you, to you, to me, to all. And God will fill all things. God's not going to show up. He's not, we're not going to have a God explosion in the air and suddenly, you know. The Bible talks about in the last days how his, the glory of the Lord will, 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 you know, just expand upon the earth. It's going to be through us. It's going to be through us. And then it says in verse 11, and he, he himself gave some. Everybody say some. This isn't everyone. This is some. Sometimes I think it's been, and I think Pastor Derek touched on this, and it was, it was well, well spoken. Sometimes I think the some gets very restricted, doesn't need to be. Some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip, to equip, to enable us to do the work of ministry. Well, if you believe like I do that what enables you to do ministry is grace, then pastors, teachers, apostles, prophets, and evangelists have a big part enabling you to receive the grace that you need. What do you have to do? See, to come into the life of a church and let primarily the pastor, the senior pastor and, and those that he authorized to speak into your life, to teach and preach and instruct you in the things of the kingdom, you're going to have to receive that. The Bible says, the scripture here says, you're going to receive grace. I actually think these equipping gifts are grace gifts. This is one of the conduits for grace is that we set ourselves under. God designed his kingdom this way. God designed the church to operate this. Not everyone has the grace to be a distributor of grace. What are you saying? Just Hold with me for a second. People that are called to 
operate in these equipping gifts. There is a grace upon their life. Paul talks a lot about it. I was going to go to these scriptures, but I knew I was going to run out of time. And he talks about how the revelation he had was by the grace of God. He talked about how his, his apostleship was by the grace of God. That's all through his writings. He said, I've been graced to do this, and I've been graced to do this. When you receive a grace gift into your life, it's so that grace can be imparted to you. As a matter of fact, I'm absolutely convinced that as believers, as Christ followers, we cannot get the fullness of God's grace working in our life unless we receive his grace gifts. Now, I thought of a good picture, so I, I'm going to bring it out right now. So I have this little device. I got this here a few months ago. It's kind of cool. I bought it at Costco. Um, you say, what is it? Well, it lives in my workshop, and I plug it in to the same source that they are, and it's always plugged in. But when I travel or go somewhere, this thing holds, it holds power. I just turned it on. It holds power. It's a, it's a 12 volt device, but it actually does a lot more than that. It's kind of cool. I don't know if you've ever seen one, but you can hook this up to the, I can hook this up to the battery of, of your car if it, you got a dead battery, it'll start your car. Power will flow. Amps will flow. It, um, it actually has a charging port, and I can hook my phone up to it and charge my phone out of it. It's kind of cool. My, let my run, phone run down. If I turn it around over here, pull this guy out, I can pump up my tires. Pretty cool, eh? I get a flat tire. This is even cooler. For those of you who know a little bit about electricity, it has an inverter in it. I turn it on, and it'll produce 110 volt power out of the battery. So I can plug in, plug in. Now it won't go forever. It's not like God. God goes forever. Actually, somewhere on here, oh, right here, there's actually, I can just stick my phone on there, and it actually has a charging pad. The Bible talks about God's manifold grace. Grace for everything, every situation. If I go over here and I hit this button, I can get a light. LED light. I think I, think I got them all. Now, why am I, what's the point of this? Am I advertising for Caterpillar? No, I don't think so. That's who made this. There are men and women who are called to spend their life so plugged into God when they minister to you, when they serve you. Ministry, Derek did, did it well. The word diakonos means servant. When they teach, when they preach, when they lead, when they instruct, that manifold grace is imparted into our lives. Some believers never allow their lives to be impacted by a pastor, by a teacher, by an apostolic gift, by prophetic gifts. You know, if you want to, if you want to be a minister of reconciliation, which you're called to, you need to get under the influence of an evangelist, because they have a grace upon their life to enable you to become a minister of reconciliation. If you want to be tied into a ministry that has a heaven mandate to take territory for the kingdom, then you need to find a ministry that's been founded under apostolic leadership. If you want insight from heaven into the plan and purpose of God, you need to sit under a prophetic voice. These are all grace giftings. It says that God gave gifts to men. That some. So my, my point simply is this meekness sitting under and receiving. Many of you in this room know this. You've done it. You've lived your life that way. Those that have been on this leadership team, you understand that. doesn't mean that they run your life or control your life, but they impart grace into your life. That's, that, that's, that's a conduit for God's power to flow into your life. 
Did I overwhelm you with too much information? It's a little quiet out there. We need grace. Amazing grace. Wonderful grace. We serve a God. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, who will do exceeding and above all that we can ask or imagine according to the power that works in you. It's Ephesians chapter 1. According to the power that works in you. What's that power? That's his grace flowing, the power of God, heaven flowing by grace into our lives. We desire to do exceeding above all that we can ask or imagine. God wants that for our lives. I'm going to have the worship team come up. I'm, I'm, I'm landing. I've got the landing gear down. We're rolling down the runway. I brought this mini power box up because this is in, in, in some limited way illustrates what those five equipping gifts should do in your life. When you need supply. Now, I'm not suggesting that you should unplug from God and just follow a leader. That's not what I'm suggesting at all. As a matter of fact, if anything, that equipping gift's going to say, look, I'm going to boost you, but you need to go get in God's presence and get charged up. That box won't sustain anybody. It just releases grace in a moment. You've got a crisis in your life, you need someone to pray with you, call Pastor Derek. He'll send somebody or he'll come. He'll hook up those cables to you. I'll get him one of these. But then he's going to say, you know what, you need, you need to stay connected to God. You need to stay connected. If you're caught in darkness, he can turn that light on. But that light's got limited. No, no man, I don't care what your assignment, what your call is, has unlimited power. Only God does. And the goal is to get you connected to God, not to man. But there, in God in his wisdom, when he decided that the church was going to be his, his plan for the age that we live in, he gave some that they might release grace, that you could be equipped to be all that God's called you to do.